technology that we live in is not something that has been constant over the ages. If we go back into sort of pre, not just pre-Christian, but uh, pre-Judaic uh, or pre-Hebrew times, what we generally tend to find are a, cos a cosmos that is very much alive, uh, where the stars, the moon, uh, the sun are deities of their own, where you know the nymphs are living in the trees and the and the streams. So this is uh, one view of the of the sky. Uh, it's a Babylonian view of the of the night sky, where you see the sky itself is inhabited by past heroes and and by by deities of different kinds. Now, what happened with the advent of the monotheism and uh, Judaism is the great demythalization of our world, and in some sense the um, removal of the divine from the material itself. So where there used to be you know, a god of the sun and, and the gods and the stars and the god of the moon, now instead in Genesis we hear that the cosmos we have is something that's created by a single God in a single nonviolent loving act. That the sun and the moon are lamps, like the little lamps that are hung on this, this vault, and so, so are the stars. Uh, this, I think, is a more important realization than the exact imagination of what the earth looks like if we go back into the Old Testament, which is something like this. You have a a dome, a firmament, which is separating the water from above from the water from below. Uh, you have this sort of middle ground, which is where we are living, the earth, which is uh, standing on pillars. And then you have the underworld uh, down below. But as I said, the important change in this cosmology, and this is quite similar sort of overall structure to the, what the Babylonian would have, would have said, but the important change is in how the different material things in the world are imagined, that they are now creations as, uh, like ourselves rather than uh, things with inherent, inherent divinity or inherent divine powers. Now this um, cosmology uh, eventually gave way to this fusion of uh, Greek uh, Greek cosmology and sort of Christian understanding of the cosmos, which is the medieval Aristotelian uh, cosmology, where um, people knew, you know, that the Earth was a sphere. So you have the earthly sphere at the center. Uh, this was not discovered by Columbus. Uh, it's actually an interesting story of how this was basically invented in the 19th century that uh, to make Columbus seem, you know, extra heroic, that that was one of the things that, uh, you know, he was being fought against by, by the, both the common people in the church, that the earth was really flat. But this was the co official cosmology of the Middle Ages, had, had the spherical earth at the center, and then the spheres of the different heavenly bodies sort of uh, in larger and larger spheres encompassing the earth. Now, this uh, cosmology obviously structurally looks different from one of the Hebrews, uh, but was also um, an important aspect of the cosmology of the medieval times is that everything has a meaning and some sort of symbolism to it. So if we are um, thinking about this, uh, why this is so ordered and structured, that we have these perfect spheres. Now, the astronomers of the Middle Ages knew that the planets could not be sitting on sort of perfect spheres around the Earth. It just doesn't fit uh, with how the planets are, are moving on the night sky. Yet, this is the cosmology that you see because it somehow it represents also the ordering, the providence uh, of God. Uh, and uh, it's important to keep in mind that when we think about so a separation of science and theology, that's, that's a pretty novel concept. While in the Middle Ages, they were much more integrated. And uh, how you describe the cosmos is going to have to be informed by both when we're looking back into the 13th and 14th century. Now, what happened in the 16th and 17th century is sort of the, the, what, if you talk um, to secularists, it's the moving of the 
Earth from the center of the universe out into sort of the, the like into a much less elevated position, just one of many bodies. Well, it's actually the concern of contemporaries uh, when the Copernican system was introduced was the opposite, that you were kind of pulling down these elevated heavenly bodies into the material uh, world. Because if you look at this, um, this picture of the cosmos, sort of artificially it looks like we are at the center of the universe. But in Aristotelian physics, the center of the universe is the worst. This is like where things are being corrupt. This is where heavy, sort of gross things are. And then if you go further away, that's where the you know, evanescent, beautiful, everlasting, eternal spheres are. So it's actually not obvious that you know, switching places of these, that that's actually something that elevates us, at least if we are still thinking in an Aristotelian medieval kind of way. But as I said, this does give, give way to the Copernican system and eventually to a very mechanical view of the cosmos. So if you've heard things like the clockwork uh, universe or clockwork cosmos, this is what comes starting with uh, Galileo, Newton, and the, uh, the, and the Enlightenment. So this is an idea where you know, the, the powers of science are starting to, as we understand it, the modern science are starting to be understood. And the regularity of the natural laws and that you can describe them with, mathem with mathematics is starting to be <coughs> unveiled. And uh, what's, what's emerging is that it seems like the universe is sort of self-going. If you just start it right, uh, then it will continue to work perfectly according to these natural laws that are inscribed on it. And uh, this is not seen at the time as a way of removing God from the picture, but it is sort of changing how God is interacting with the universe. So before, in the Arist in Aristotelian medieval uh, worldview, um, you have a physics that depends on the things in themselves. So, you know, if a stone falls to the ground because it has heaviness, so it wants to be uh, closer to the center. Uh, when we enter into the more modern period, instead what we have is a set of laws that are sort of imposed from above rather than intrinsic to objects, and that these laws come directly from God. So it's very much uh, like we're still in a time where there is a close connection between science and religion, but it is a very different one compared to a couple of hundred years earlier. That now God has, is really the lawgiver. And... Uh, in, he could have given other laws than the ones he did. That this is, this is laws that are imposed from, from the outside. Now, it doesn't take that long before we go from a, a society where God is seen as the necessary lawgiver uh, to that you sort of drop the God part and you just keep the natural laws, which is basically what happens in the 19th century. If you have an eternal universe, which is what people believed at the time, and laws that seem eternal, um, it is not that intuitive that you need to have someone to sort of institute these laws or to get it started. Uh, so it is, while if you go back and read something like the cosmological arguments uh, for God, it doesn't really, it doesn't matter if the universe is eternal or not, you still need a first cause. But I would say it's less intuitive that you need it if you are convinced that the universe is, is eternal. Now, what happens in the 20th century is, of course, that we realize that the universe, at least the universe that we inhabit, whether that is everything that is, is debated, uh, that that is not eternal, that there is a beginning to the universe that we inhabit. Now, this was introduced by the idea of the Big Bang as the beginning of the universe was introduced by a Catholic priest, Monsieur Lemaitre. Um, maybe because of that, maybe because of other, I say, metaphysical prejudices, uh, this was not a theory that was happily received by most uh, at its time. Um, to many, it smelled like papism and uh, religion to suggest that there was this beginning to the universe sounded a bit too suspiciously like Genesis uh, to many. Um, the Catholic Church was extremely happy to accept it very, very quickly. Uh, 
actually, Lemaitre was not always as happy about the endorsements he got from the church as that, you know, further seemed to uh, increase the suspicion of some of his fellow physicists. But uh, we know now, as much as we know anything, that there was a beginning to the universe uh, a little more than 13 billion years ago. Um, there was a quick a expansion, the details of which uh, is still worked out, but we had this quick early inflation. Uh, and then, we, ever since then, we have had what first seemed like a steady expansion and now uh, probably an accelerating expansion of, of the universe. Uh, there's uh, the times and the distances we're talking about here are vast. Uh, so, as so I already, we're talking about billions of years in time. I mean, that on its own is something that we can't really imagine as human beings who are used to thinking about times in terms of seconds, minutes, hours, and, you know, days, years. Uh, but, again, I think, uh, if, if a medieval, imagine if a medieval knew about the Big Bang, what they would do with this in terms of ascribing meaning to it. I think that someone like... Thomas Aquinas or others, or even the patristic writers, if they found out that the universe was, you know, close to 14 billion years ago, 14 billion years old, and is immensely large, that they would immediately jump to that this being an icon and a symbol on God's vastness and, at, at, you know, infinity and eternity. So I actually don't think this is something that, as Catholics, we should be the least worried about that the cosmos we inhabit is an incredibly large one. It is also an evolving universe. So the universe as it looked when it was a few hundred million years old is very different from the universe as it looks today. It took quite a bit of expansion for the universe to cool down enough for there to be atoms, uh, for there to be stars to be able to come together and form. So stars form basically from uh, atoms collapsing that are, you know, uh, atoms that are more diffusely distributed to start to collapse in on themselves until it gets hotter and hotter and you form a star. That took some time before you could, uh, that could happen. Um, but after, within a billion years or so of the Big Bang, you do have something that's starting to resemble the universe we have today. You have galaxies, you have stars, might even have planets. Uh, but as the universe continues, for each generation of stars, things get a little bit different. Galaxies look a little bit different, the composition looks a little bit different, and so on. And it is not only in, let's see, uh, only in terms of physics that we do have an evolving uh, universe. Uh, the, actually, before we knew there was a Big Bang and that the universe had a beginning, uh, Darwin and others found out that we have a biological evolution uh, on Earth. Before that, we f the, uh, there were uh, a deeper, there was um, the study of rocks showed that we have a geological history here on Earth. And as we'll see a bit more, we also have a chemical evolution in the universe. So in whichever science we look, it is clear that we do have a historical uh, universe, that we have uh, new structures emerging as the, as the universe uh, grows older, and uh, that we have new processes, new kinds of things coming into being and going away uh, as time uh, progresses. Now, if we think about what kind of God there is behind this creation, I think you get something that's quite different compared to the mechanistic, uh, sort of mathematical lawgiver of the a cosmos of the Enlightenment, which I think is actually the science that most of us have sort of in the back of our head when we think about science and religion still, simply because, and you know this because you teach high school, we, we mainly stop uh, at Newton when we teach physics, right? We, we don't go much beyond that because that is the foundation for the, for the later physics. Biology, yeah, a little bit of evolution, but uh, you know, it's limited what you can do in, on a high school level. And the same, I think, with chemistry, most people are just not aware that the chemistry changes over the past 14 billion years. Uh, so we kind of stop where we still have this sort of clockwork universe. We still have this very mechanistic uh, universe that seems to be, in some sense, eternal. 
Well, the one, the, the cosmos that has been emerging over the past 150 years or so is one that is very different. It's a, it is one that um, has a beginning. It is one where there seems to be an active creation going on, as well as you had this sort of initial creative event. Now, I don't want to, like, I'm, I would not encourage you to try to match, you know, Genesis to sort of developments in science sort of one-to-one, -one. but I do think that it is providential uh, that we live in a universe where there are so many icons of creation that sort of constantly forces us to uh, ponder uh, a creator. Like, it is difficult to not think about why the Big Bang happened, right? Uh, that is a much more pressing question than if the universe was just eternal, uh, which is what the people thought in the 19th century.